Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finet, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus an innovation hub school of consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 196 with Sean Hanrahan. Sean is the Senior Environmental Strategist at City West Water, where he works across a range of areas including climate change, renewable energy, resource recovery, and sustainability. More recently, Sean has managed City West Water's Innovation Fund. In establishing and managing the Innovation Fund, Sean has worked across City West Water to build employee engagement, identify innovative ideas, and prioritize their prototyping and implementation. Sean holds a degree in biomedical science and a master's in environment and sustainability, both from Monash University. We explore a number of topics in this episode, including one, how to get and maintain buy-in for innovation at a large government-owned agency, two, City West Water's innovation process, and three, trends and developments in water innovation. So with that, I bring you Sean Hanrahan. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. We've been chatting uh, for a little while about having you on the program, um, and it's great to finally have it come to fruition. Um, having caught up with you a few times for dinner recently, um, we tend to wax um, enthusiastic about lots of different topics related to technology and innovation, so really excited to have you on the show today. But um, for our guests who may not be familiar with who Sean Hanrahan is, Perhaps you can give us the uh, 2,000 foot view. Yeah, so I work uh, with the CWS Water and our strategy and um, planning team. I've mm-hmm. uh, been there for a few years now in a variety of different roles. Um, my background is sort of environmental science. Um, and I've been working across sort of climate change, renewable energy, and a range of different things. And in the last 12 to 18 months, I've uh, been had the fortune of running our innovation program at CWS Water. And that's um, been a great experience. And now I met yourself. And um, yeah, it's been a lot sort of deep dive into what the innovation world has been fascinating all right thus far and yeah looking forward to that to continue yeah excellent and i think a lot of um, our listeners might get some value out of firstly understanding what kind of organization city west water is yeah great so we're the water retailer for the west of melbourne so our service area covers the cbd all the way out to the airport and down to Werribee. Yeah. um we we provide the water and wastewater services to roughly a million people um, a bit over and one of some of the like, fastest growing areas in melbourne um, in Australia, um, and we're the sort of customer-facing um, part of the water cycle, if you will. So you've got the dams mm-hmm. um, and, and the large treatment plants that are run by Melbourne Water. Um, yep. We provide the Melbourne water from Melbourne Water and, and sell it and sell it to people and provide billing services and all, all that in between. Um, and yeah, we're, we're essentially uh, trying to manage the, the rapidly growing parts of Melbourne and ensure that we provide a great service and water security for for Melbourne in the future. Yeah. So. City West Water is also a wholly government-owned agency, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we're, we're, owned by, we're owned by the government, and the government write a statement of obligations that we have to follow, so mm-hmm. it outlines all the things that we need to do um, to ensure that we're providing the services to the people of Victoria that that, um, that they're after. Sure. Um, so yeah, they're very much a government-owned and run, yeah, well, government-owned so, organisation. Yeah, so I guess a lot of the challenges that apply, say, to your typical public service institution uh, also apply to City West Water in so far as becoming more innovative is concerned, experimentation, moving faster, um, embracing risk and failure because you are dealing with you know, taxpayer dollars and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. We have, we, there's a, 
it's certainly it's something that we're very mindful of and mm-hmm. it's a risk of it. You know, water is a very important resource and people value it highly. You know, People the, take it for granted as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, for us, it's, it's really a matter of um, yeah, trying to manage that and, and understanding that innovation uh, doesn't necessarily mean breaking everything. Um, but it does, it's certainly there are some challenges involved with that. We are a risk averse business. We need to be, yeah. um, and that's something that we'll, we will manage going forward. But it's also equally important that if we're going to be um, the most livable city going forward, we're also going to have to innovate because yeah. there's all these millions of people that are going to come to, to live in our area across across Victoria. Um, so that the way we've done things in the past need to be innov- need to be improved and changed to ke- to keep up with that to ensure we can provide those services going forward. So we've got that tension to try and mitigate risk on one side, but also the drivers to, to improve and to do, uh, become even better. Mm, definitely. And I guess before we touch on some of the things you've, you've briefly mentioned there, curious to know how the innovation agenda, I suppose, came about at City West Water. What prompted it? Um, was it senior decision makers or was it bottom-up push? What happened there? Yeah, so uh, we, um, we had a new managing director come in probably 18 months or so, a bit more ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after a while, was, the decision was made to write a new uh, business strategy yep. for the business. And um, as part of that, they did a, a, a lengthy uh, consultation process, looking um, for outside and also inside as to what we should be doing, mm-hmm. um, what, what would a big good business strategy have in it. And one of those things that came out through the staff consultation process and through, um, through the executive was a need to innovate and a need to do things better in, in, in a variety of areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was essentially pulled out as one of the key initiatives in that business strategy. When it was launched, there was a number of things that we're going to do straight up, mm-hmm. and that launching an innovation fund was, was one of those. Um, and then from there, we, we went about sort of developing uh, developing up a, a process or a strategy for how we're going to implement that, mm-hmm. and, then can, and then sort of pushed it forward. Um, so going forward, so yeah, it was a, uh, essentially a business strategy-led thing at the start. And then from there, we basically got, the, got in the business strategy, we needed to do it, and then we made it happen. Excellent, excellent. And so, I mean, we're seeing this uh, sort of evolution come about in lots of organizations these days, whether they're public sector, private, um, whatever the case may be. Now, oftentimes, it does fall into the bucket of theater, right, where companies will go off, will run, say, some kind of a big create an innovation lab and all that sort of jazz. You know, you know the story well. How have City West Water approached this to, I suppose, avoid some of that and to try and get the most value out of it? Because I imagine being relatively early in that sort of innovation life cycle in the maturity curve of transforming to being a more innovative organization, your objectives right now probably aren't to come along with the next disruptive product in water. I imagine it would be more about engagement and awareness of what you guys are trying to do. So. Talk to me about what the objective is right now, say in the first six to 12 months of this program, and how are you guys going about, say, working towards that? Yeah, so it definitely, early days, it was definitely about engagement and yeah. persuading, making people believe um, that it wasn't theatre. Because that was, that was the natural tendency of like, oh yeah, this is just another initiative that you're gonna do, and then six months from now, we're not even gonna be talking about this anymore. Yeah. Um, so it was certainly something that we were very mindful of. And we had a strong focus, you know, in the way we launched the fund, getting some like yourself to a keynote to say, you know, we're serious. Um, we then followed that up with information sessions, um, talking to different people. The way that people were submitting ideas was to get each other talking across the business. So even if we've got lots of ideas, but the, the thing behind it was not so much just the volume, but it was actually getting people talking across the business about it. So how did you do that? So essentially we had the, the template which required, if you want to put in an idea to the, to the fund, mm-hmm. um, you need to get a couple of other people from across different business units to put their name down. And that doesn't mean that they had to write the thing with you, but mm. they would. They, you persuaded them to put their name to what you had, um, and lots of people did that. We had eighty-seven ideas um, get sent in, and we had more than a hundred staff be involved in those ideas. Out of how many staff? Out of, uh, roughly a bit over four hundred and fifty staff. Pretty good. So we had lots of lots of different people start to really get, get excited, and, and we did that through through the launch, through having a template there, through constant email communication, updating staff. Mm. Um, we had, ran some lunchtime drop-in sessions for people to ask questions or uh, need, who needed help with their ideas. Um, yeah, and just and also we started a, um, we had an innovation little blog that we went up on our, on our intranet side, just sort of talking, just constantly keeping it front of front and center, um, sort of giving little bits of tidbits of advice or interesting videos that they could watch. And then there, were, there was also a Yammer page. So 
Yammer is like a social media thing for, for work. Yeah. Um, so we've got a Yammer network for City West Water people. And so on that, we post, um, post resources, post different videos, and also try and get some interaction amongst amongst the staff who might, I'm interested about this idea, and then that would allow other people to see it so mm. they can get in contact with them. Yeah, yeah, and that was one thing that struck me when I did give that keynote, the launch of the program was the amount of people that turned up. It showed that there was a real appetite for innovation and for looking for new ways or better ways of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. It was, I, I was nervous. I was nervous before that. Because <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you sort of tell people we're having, and you sort of go, okay, it's like your 21st birthday. You, you sort of invite all these people and you hope they're going to show up. Yeah, yeah. And then um, we, we're sort of standing there probably 20 minutes beforehand and people start rolling in. I'm like, oh, this is good. There's at least a couple of people here. Yeah, and yeah. So, you know, yeah, we had a standing room. Yeah, it was really good, really good. Um, but yeah, as someone who runs events regularly, I totally empathize with that feeling of, hey, I've run, you know, put out all these invites of, you know, let's hope people turn up. Mm. And it's always a little bit of anxiety the first five or 10 minutes where two or three people turn mm. up, like, oh, I hope there's a few more coming. And then just a big barrage usually turn up and that's, it's all good. You've done your job. But um, I guess keen for our audience to better understand the process. So you went through this big sort of um, awareness building campaign, you know, posting stuff on Yammer, um, getting people to form more or less cross-functional teams and saying, hey, you've got to speak to two people from other functional units in order to submit your idea, all this sort of good stuff. So you had 87 ideas collected over what sort of time period? Uh, it was probably about six, seven weeks. Six, seven weeks. That's fantastic. So about 20% of the organization, if not more, mm -hmm. engaged in the program. So what happened then? Like you mentioned earlier that the organization, one of the challenges is it's quite risk averse. So was there, say, different buckets or criteria you use to evaluate, say, more risky ideas versus your, say, more business as usual ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the key focus was just we separate them into, into two buckets, the, mm -hmm. um, the more innovative bucket and the business improvement bucket. Yeah. So we did that essentially by defining business improvement as something that if we had the equipment and the processes and the capability to do that, we just needed to put a bit of time and, or um, to change that. Mm -hmm. So it was more of an incremental sort of improvement. On, on what was existing, it went into the business improvement bucket, and then if it was a bit different to that, and it would require new capabilities, new technologies, or something along those lines, we put it in the innovative bucket. And then we separated them by, we got a group of people from across the business, from, from each different department, mm -hmm. um, and myself, and we, we sat around a table, and we went through the ideas, but we put up the definitions on the wall, saying this is innovative, this is business improvement, yep. and then we went and around the room, discussed it, put them into different piles, mm -hmm. And then from there, the business improvement ideas were then allocated to the different departments at the GM level to say, okay, these are some business improvement ideas that your staff have come up with. Mm -hmm. um, have, have a look at those and come back to us with what, what's going to happen. And then the innovative ideas were then um, reviewed by, by myself. Um, and then top 18 were listed to pitch to the, um, to the Innovate or the group of GMs yeah. that yeah. were and yourself that were evaluating the ideas. And there were a bunch of other ideas who were, that were also in that innovative pile that perhaps a bit less developed than the, the top 18. Mm -hmm. um, but they were still reviewed by all the, all the executive and there was a chance given to say, okay, is one of these ideas that weren't pitched to you, should, should that also be um, one of the top five ideas that gets mm. picked out going forward? Because that was a thing that, of the ideas that got pitched. The top five were then given some support and funding to, to push their idea forward. And the other ones uh, were essentially uh, said, they're good ideas, but right now these are the these five are the priority. So um, yeah, yeah, that's essentially how we how we separated them. Excellent. Out. Um, and of those eighteen ideas that were classed as say innovative, um, what kind of say criteria did you use to evaluate say which ones which five would go through to the next stage? Yeah, so we we start, like any like any innovative process, we start I drew up a scoring sheet about how it was all going how it was all going to play mm -hmm. out, and this is this is the scoring, this is the weighting that was going to provide it. Yeah. Um, but in the end, when we were trying to assess it, it didn't quite play out, so we, yeah. we, we adjusted. But it, it all did, the themes were sort of still there, and that was alignment to the business strategy. Um, the, you know, so in our new business strategy, there's a bunch of key uh, pillars pulled out. So how closely did it align to that? How, cl how closely was it going to help our customers? That was a, a big focus of the, of, of the fund, mm -hmm. was where, were the, where was the customer benefit going to come? Um, how well had they addressed the problem? So. You know, we weren't so much worried about solutions. Like they could have had three or four solutions, but yeah. it was where is the problem that they had um, a, a really important one to, to solve yeah. or an opp a great opportunity to take? Um, what was the size of that? So it was more about what, what pre-work had gone into it rather than the perfect 
solution at the end. Um, so that, that was certainly a big focus as well for us. Um, and then, yeah, we, we utilizing that we had those sorts of criteria in front of us as we, we, we reviewed all the ideas. And then at the end, we had a, had a big discussion around where, based on that and, and the, their interactions with them as part of the pitch, where did people uh, feel with, with the, the top five ideas? And, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't take us too long to actually for that to fall out from that discussion, really. Yeah. And I think one thing that was really good about the um, Innovate judging panel was that you had a good mix of GMs on there. I mean, I was on there as well from outside the, of, the, of the organization, bringing in a fresh perspective. And by doing that, you're far more likely to have that sort of tension at the table where people, one person might like an idea, another person won't, but then they have that conversation. Mm. And either the person who liked it gets convinced that actually maybe it's not such a great idea, or the person that didn't like it says, oh, actually, now I see why you think this is a good idea. And it kind of reminds me of, I mean, it's a tool that's used in agile uh, software development, for, for example, the Fibonacci sequence, using that to prioritize ideas or prioritize problems and features. And then you also have that, say, with Pixar and their brain trust, just bringing people together to just be as honest as possible um, around what they think about a movie um, without fear of recourse and all the rest of it. So I think that's a fantastic thing that you guys did as part of that program. One thing you mentioned there, Sean, was alignment to the business strategy. That that was one of the key criteria. Now, one thing that stood out for me working with City Westwater on this program has been the executive buy-in from David and the rest of the guys has been very strong from, from the outside looking in, at least in my um, interactions. Um, not only the initial buy-in, but the ongoing buy-in. And the, I suppose David, uh, who is um, hitting up City West Water, has also conceded that this is going to be challenging, but we need to make this investment. So talk to me about getting that buy-in initially. Um, it sounds like you, know, you went through the whole consultative process, but what's it been like maintaining that buy-in um, and how important has that alignment to business strategy been? Yeah, really important. So that was... Um being a key part of the business, like at the launch of the business strategy, the innovation fund, mm. it was, and it was also really important that uh, that anything we do kept alignment to that. So the whole reason why you have a business strategy is because it's supposed to be a bit of a, your, north, your guiding light. Of course. You know, that, that one star that you, you follow. And so that the fund had to basically enable that. Mm. Um, so from from the get-go, it was made really clear that, that had to, the innovation fund, you know, it was going to be, could go in a number of different directions, but so long as that direction was in line with what we had in the strategy, it was... Uh, um, yeah, it was uh, really, really important. So we made that pretty clear. And then we also, in drafting, uh, to get help get support, so we would write up a proposal for how the innovation fund was going to work. Mm -hmm. And then we would put that to the, to the executive. So I would give, give it a chance to um, to look at it and say, okay, that's what you're doing. I've got a chance to give to give my take on how, yeah. and how that could be improved. Um, and also, when we when we were evaluating the ideas into business improvement and into the innovating, we also got the GMs were able to nominate their person from across the business to form that team that mm -hmm. assessed them, they were nominating a person from their part. So they felt that their area was also being represented across the business. Yeah. So it was very much an, an inclusive process um, for, for the first time around. It was very much around bringing everyone along for the ride and everyone mm -hmm. having a chance to, to give them um, their perspective. Um, and that I think that was really helpful in that process. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was really important that for the innovation fund sake that the business strategy called it out. You know, that, that, that sort of allowed yeah. Um, the momentum to get built, to get built, and so that actually just getting it in the strategy was was a really key part. Yeah. Um, we, from there, all the doors sort of open. You can point to that business strategy and say, "Yep, it's there. It's shown as a really important thing. Let's make it happen." Mm. Um, so yeah, that was, was also really really important. For yeah. Us. So two key things there was the business strategy alignment, but also involving key decision makers as part of the the process of formulating what that innovation strategy would look like, rather than just saying, "All right, here it is. Take it or leave it." It was that ongoing consultative approach and including key decision makers and even people further down the food chain, um, so to speak, to get that buy-in initially, but to also maintain it. And I guess once you've got that ownership, people want to work with you to make sure that, okay, this isn't working, let's try something else and let's figure out what the best path of attack for our organization is right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah completely agree. Yeah. Fantastic. I guess before I go on with the next stage in the innovation program, I mean, it sounds like from what I've seen, Melbourne Water... Uh, Southeast Water, Bowen, Sydney, innovation seems to be uh, top of mind for a lot of these agencies and also across the world. I mean, what's prompting this across the board? Because you guys had your own sort of internal consultative process, but I mean, what are the key sort of trigger points, say internationally, globally, that are forcing water bodies to start thinking about this kind of stuff? 
Yeah, so I suppose um, Millennium Drought in, in Victoria mm. um, sort of pro- raised a number of concerns going forward around water security and reliability, mm-hmm. um, rapidly growing population in Australia. And also there's things like globally speaking, like the, the um, World Economic Forum does a report each year about yep. the global risks. Water crises are always in the top five of their mm. risks going like every year. And because of because of that, like, and water being such an important resource for people, so it's front of mind, you know, there's a greater understanding of the community around water brought about by that millennium drought. So there's an expectation from people yep. that the water's security and reliable, secure and reliable. But also we're also getting pulled by the number of people that are here. Try you've got to try and support it. agriculture, industry people, environmental flows. So there's all these things that we need to try and provide. Mm. Um, and that doesn't get um, any easier with, with things like climate change and with things like population growth. So that those, those are sort of drivers for us. But there's also a much greater focus now on customer mm-hmm. um, and, understand, and understanding customers and providing the services that they want. Um, and that's not a matter of saying, this is what the, us saying, this is what the customer wants. This is allowing the customer to say what they want. Um, yeah. And so that that also is, is a big uh, big driver for all of this because there's, there's also um, yeah the customer satisfaction they how comfortable customers feel with with how well we are managing yeah. the water and providing those services and and the security of those services going forward into the future so we, we can see challenges coming up in the future with regards to population and climate change and so we need to get ready for those and part of the way you get ready is by looking at new and different ways of doing things yeah. um, new innovative technologies and processes. Um, just for coll- means of collaboration. So all the water corporations in, in Australia do collaborate a fair bit. Mm-hmm. And so when we hear about what South East or Melbourne Water or Yarra Valley Water are doing, you know, we go, oh, that's great. Well, what, how did you do that? What, how did that work? Like we start to actually, um, yeah, compare notes and, mm-hmm. and also share the learnings from different things. So we do take a lot of uh, heed from what each other do. So if one person does it, then the other people start to you know, get interested in it as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it's... I suppose encouraging to hear that the water bodies do collaborate rather than you know draw lines between each other and say no we're west side of Melbourne and that's it you guys are you know east side and we more or less see see you as enemies right mm-hmm. like that like what you get in a lot of large organisations where they do have these solo departments like Sony's a classic case study where they had the um, the record label and they had portable music side of the business and they just competed but they didn't bring that together to come up with something transformative like the iPod, right? They left that to Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then Sony's market share obviously dwindled um, thereafter. But um, I like what you talked about there, um, what you touched on with being more customer centric, because you know I think the study is that by 2020, customer experience will outweigh quality and price when people make purchasing decisions. We've got good customer satisfaction ratings at the moment, but yep. in order to keep those there, you keep, you need to keep upping your game. You know, like they, customers interact not just with us, they interact with a whole range of other service providers yep. to provide services in different ways using uh, different approaches uh-huh. so if we're if we're standing still while everyone else is moving forward and providing better and better and better customer service then we we don't um, we won't keep that those satisfaction levels there you mm-hmm. know it's really important that we um look to where what other people are doing and other, other water utilities other sectors yeah. um so that we don't stand still um because if you do then, then you de- you're dead like you know yeah. it's, it's, it's really it's really important to keep uh keep moving forward and to learn from other people um because yeah they're they're if uh, perception of us is not just shaped by just purely what we do. They're, they, they interact with lots of other people um, who are constantly doing different uh, approaches and are upping their game on customer satisfaction, yeah. you know, across the board. It's not just with water, it's with everything now that customer service is, is king. Yeah. Um, and so we've got, we've got to be part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, if, we, if we want to keep up and keep our customers happy, um, because ultimately that's what we're, we're really here to do is, we're, you know, we're here to serve the community. Um, mm-hmm. We're pretty passionate about that at, at City West. Like we, we, Take not only the providing water services really seriously, um, but also the cust- the community health and community well being that comes comes with that. Um, you know, we've got a different programs around green in the west and helping urban um, increase urban canopy cover. Mm-hmm. Um, we do lots of community events, so we, we we certainly see our role as one of providing great service, providing water reliably, mm-hmm. but also in, um, being an active participant in our community. Um, so then that's really part of our role is to do all those three things really really well yeah yeah and uh, it's, it's funny um, customer service in water is an interesting one because if you wake up in the morning turn on the tap water comes out you don't send a letter to city west water an email saying hey guys thanks the water's working you know people just expect that but flip the table and if um, the tap doesn't work 
your customer service line just gets absolutely flooded with people from that area saying, hey, what's up, you know? Because water is one of those, we take it for granted, but it is the most sought after, one of the most sought after commodities that serves such a big role, plays such a big role in our lives. So it's kind of that tricky sort of balancing act there. But um, on that, one of the ideas that came through the program, and I guess I wanted to explore the ideas that uh, were taken forward out of the um, initial pitch event was around customer service and say using tools like chatbots, for example, to automate a lot of that first line of defense stuff. And we see tech companies do this all the time online, whether it's Amazon, Facebook, and many others. In some cases, I think they take it too far where it's, they've made it absolutely impossible to find a real person. And obviously that's by design, uh, but it can be also very frustrating for their clients. So let's talk about some of the ideas that came through the program. What kinds of ideas were they? Business model innovation, what kinds of technologies were they um, leveraging and We'll go from there. Yeah, so like you said, the chatbot was one of those. Um, so we're looking at experimenting and, cre- and creating one for our website yeah. that, um, like you said, is, is not designed to replace uh, a person. Mm-hmm. It's very much designed like people want 24-7 service now. Yeah. And our, our phones are only open, you know, nine to five. Um, so to provide that service, to provide, if, you know, if I get home late from work one night and I've got a basic inquiry, there's potential, and lots of people are, are using the web more and more for their yeah. services, um, is looking at creating you know, a, a chatbot that can help answer or point them in the right direction to solve their query, but also looking at building into that potential web chat. So the potential to add the per, uh, a person from City West Water yeah. at the other end as well. So there's a basic inquiry, they can't quite get, if the chatbot can't do it, mm-hmm. it, it passes over to a person who can also work. And then the, the phone is there as well. So, and then you know, customers, there's a number of different channels that they wanna, wanna leverage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for years we've, we've focused on, on, on the phones, but also now we wanna keep that there, but we also wanna add a few more strings to the bow to enable that greater service across across time um, and flexible. You know, some lots of younger people yeah. don't want to call. They want it. They want. They want the to texting generation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's providing the service for them, but also if you want to call, if there's com- some complexity to what's been going on for yourself, then you should also have that opportunity to, to call in. So yeah, we feel that's really complementary. Um, we've got our virtual reality idea as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where we're looking to create a prototype uh, virtual reality tour of a stormwater. A harvesting scheme that we've got going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the initial part is for uh, community engagement, helping the community understand. Um, it can be used for, for kids' education around, you know, this is what the stormwater harvesting um, system can do. It's a new learning environment to help build community understanding of, of, of what we do. Mm-hmm. But equally, we see lots of potential for VR in sort of design review. Um, and, you know, Brock, what well, the, the person who's leading that idea, yep. City West, you know, he was here the other night for the yeah, VR, yeah. Um, VR uh, night. Um, so that, and that was great. So he's constantly sort of learning. So we view that there's opportunities for reviewing designs, um, basically as a, as a collaborative tool across the business. You know, for, for when you do plans, um, there are, you've got big A1, A2 sheets of paper with all these plans across yeah. across desk, and that, that's one way, and that's important. But also, imagine if you added another layer to that, where there was a VR aspect to it that could help that immersion and that re- when you're reviewing things, reviewing planning. A specific design you know there are there are people out there already who are using vr for, for design yeah view. yeah um so we we see a lot of scope for improvement in that but like anything with vr you want to start small um you know and we give rock and the other ideas two thousand dollars to develop their idea mm-hmm. you know he's gone out and bought a camera and some software he's going to build that um that uh, tour and then from there we're going to take some learnings and we're going to keep keep going and iterating mm-hmm. um to take that um because there's heaps of opportunities in that space to just in, uh, in help our, our people to do even better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the VR idea. Um, and then we've also got the idea around, it's called opt-in. So essentially asking our customers, is are there other services that you would like to opt in to? Sure. Um, you know, finding out if they're there. We're not, we're not sure if they are. This is about, it's about testing um, because the services you get from your water utility, they're quite standard. You, you pay for your water and you pay for your sewage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people will have a, are very passionate about the environmental front, so they might be they want, might want something that plants tre- a program that helps plant trees or support planting trees or carbon emissions reductions. Other people um, might have different approaches of what they would like from from us. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is about really identifying that. What, what what could you opt into? What could you choose to be a part of if you wanted to? to? And that's for us is very much important about uh, providing service levels that match what you want. You know, for it's been standardised forever, and that standardised service is still there. Yeah. But it's like on top of that, do people want more? 
Mm. And it, they might, they might not. Might not. Yeah. And this is about finding that out. Yeah. Um, and then the other ideas was the uh, water power digital meter. So the idea that you know could you power a, a, a meter by the water pressure in the pipes? Mm -hmm. um, so that was quite an exciting idea. We've we've gone through a bit of a process with that, but we sort of realised that for us we're not a meter manufacturer, and um, you know the, the the complexity and the creation of something like that is not something we really built up to do. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't push that forward. It's yeah. about okay, well, how can we empower other people to come to us with ideas on that on that front? Yeah. So how did that um, epiphany come about? Because I know initially the view was that this is something that we could build internally, but you guys went through a bit of sort of a few iterations of thinking more, more than anything else to get to that point where you're like, actually, maybe we can be the customer for something like this and empower another organization to go out and build it. Yeah, so after after the, the, the fund was uh, launched, we've had our five ideas, the, people, the teams from those ideas came in for a training day, mm -hmm. um, working for the Business Canvas model. Yep. Um, and then that was sort of looking at uh, you know, the problems and the solutions and we were looking at there's a problem here that we want to power the digital the, the meter from mm -hmm. renewable sources and then the solution and like this is just one solution of many mm -hmm. for powering a meter from renewable sources and we're like well should we be picking a winner at this stage like we've got a, an end goal in mind but there are a number of different ways to get there we're not built up to, to develop create test prototype meters yeah. um, you know we're, we're there to, to find the products and put them in the right places um, so we went, well, maybe we're not the right people for this, we, this is something that we would like in the future. Maybe there are other mechanisms, you know, working with meter providers or putting out there that this we are a business that's interested in these things. Yeah. Um, you know, then people can come to you and, and, and hear you up front with their ideas, and then you can evaluate them on, on their merits. Um, so that was for us a bit of a learning to go. Okay, we have an idea, but we're just not built for the execution of it. Mm. Um, and maybe there are other people who are. Yeah, and I think that's possibly something that's overlooked by a lot of organizations who have, say, the brand, the resources, um, the cloud of someone like a city of Wastewater, where, yes, innovating internally will require quite a bit of transformation, time, effort, and that definitely needs to take place. But at the same time, where we can start to create immediate impact is by leveraging that cloud to empower other organizations out there to be innovative. Because oftentimes, you might find some really you know, forward thinking, visionary entrepreneurs out there, but what they lack oftentimes is that first customer who's willing to take take a bet on them, mm -hmm. um, even if it's a small bet, right? And that's why we're seeing the um, accelerator programs popping up, reverse pitching programs, where companies can so kind of diversify across a number of different startups. Uh, it doesn't necessarily even need to be a startup, it could be an SME, it could be them partnering with um, somebody out of academia, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, but ultimately, that way you can create that immediate impact because you're decreasing the risk for these startups. And when you decrease the risk, people obviously are willing to take those bets. Mm -hmm. So has City West Water explored anything beyond the hackathon um, so far as the um, water powered meters are concerned? Not just yet. So it's, it's certainly been um, it's something we'll look to do. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of more broadly, the, the, the dealing with those, um, you know, what other partners are there that you can partnerships that you can yeah. form? It's it probably uh, for the next phase. We sort of flagged it as something that we want to look at. Mm -hmm. how, how do we get those um, partnerships going? You know, for, for an organisation like us, it's not it's not necessarily easy to partner with with the smaller organisations. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that that needs to stay that way. We we want to. We want to change that and yeah. we want to find the best possible partners that we can. So um, so you, when you say it's not easy to partner with small organizations, we're talking about things like procurement policies and yeah. so on. And yeah. there's also, there are standardized things about, you know, levels of insurance, yeah. or different um, ISO accreditations. There are things um, that are very important and they will still remain important for some areas of our, that will remain important for some areas of our business, but yeah. there might be other smaller little things off to the side that have, that will have a very low risk really. Um, that where we could partner with other people, um, mm. you know, partner with some different people who are, who are smaller, more in, you know, very innovative, yeah. uh, have bigger ideas. Um, so yeah, that's something that we can sort of look to in the next part of our program is, is once we build some, continue to build some momentum, mm -hmm. is that next shift is who else is out there that we can partner with? We can't do this all on our own. Yeah. Um, we want to partner with other water corporations. We want to partner with other business, private enterprise. Yeah. 
um, you name it, it's about the best partner for the results, you know, because it all comes back to the customer. Yeah, and, and I think today companies need to be partnering with external bodies more than ever because one thing that's become apparent is the average employee tenure is getting shorter and shorter. So I think at City West Water, it's something, by, something like less than two years, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that, but knowledge management, especially amongst Gen Y and millennial talent, is a massive issue. So if you're losing people at a, you know, increasing frequency, you need to either find a way to engage and retain them longer, or you can find a way to engage with external parties um, in a way that meaningfully creates positive outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that something for us, so there's the two parts to it is trying to help people stay, um, stay around, fulfilled in their roles. And so mm-hmm. they said, we've got a big culture program going at the moment designed um, for that is to join you know, get people uh, um, you know, in the culture that they want to create, you know, yeah. a high performing culture. Um, and so that's certainly part of it too, is so we're really focused on, on that and, and get, building the innovative, innovation capacity across our, across the whole organization yeah. and the culture there. Um, but then, yeah, like I said, partnering with other people as well, it's really important your approach, you have that double approach, um, you know, the books are basically building up your own capability mm-hmm. and the people there and rewarding them and making them feel um, uh, that they're appreciated and their work is valued. Um, and then there's also partnering with other people as well, you know, that, that you can that can add value, um, that have a skill set that we don't necessarily have or haven't had to have. You know, we've we sort of spoke a bit before about the reliability of running water. Yeah. You know, it's because of the great work done by people gone before us is that we we take it for granted. And that's because of the hard work of all yeah. these people. Um, if we want to keep it like that, you know, we need to keep pushing forward and, and growing and evolving and managing that going forward because there's all this historic knowledge across our business and across lots of different mm-hmm. businesses and it's about tapping into that um, and keeping that keeping that there and passing it on to others and it's also about yeah uh, retaining your talent and then partnering also. yeah and that's a great point you know the work we do today in innovation is just building upon what came before us and there's a great quote who, who it's from escapes me at this moment, but obviously this mushroom coffee isn't working, but um, we overestimate what we can do in one year, but underestimate what we can do in say 10 years. Mm. By planting these seeds today at City West Water, by setting up this innovation program, by exploring different ways of working and doing things, next year you'll be a little bit further ahead in that journey. Yeah. But if you go into it thinking, okay, by 12 months from now, we're gonna have some sort of disruptive product in market, it's gonna be generating X number of whatever customers or obviously revenue is a key indicator for City West Water, but whatever the success metric is, let's just focus on the leading indicators at the moment. I mean, initially it was engagement, awareness, getting employees working together cross-functionally across the organization, and it seems like you guys are doing that quite well. And then running something like a hackathon um, starts to shift the mindset around what's possible and um, how we can go about doing things. So on that, what were some of, say, the key lessons that came out of it? Obviously one was you know, with the uh, water meters there was that, hey, we don't need to build this. Mm. But what sort of process did you guys go through during that uh, hackathon and to come up with those types of learnings and what were some of the other sort of key lessons? Yeah, so definitely for us, it was about um, the, the, the guidance materials we provided at the start around the mm. ID template. So not sort, of, not sort of playing free for all, give us your ideas. You know, we had a very structured approach. It didn't require a lot of work, but it yeah. basically put the ideas, you know, business strategy alignment, have you partnered with people? And then, so that made it very clear for people from day one, okay, this is the form that I need to fill out. Yep. And then we gave them the key criteria which their idea was gonna be assessed by. And we gave them the plans around, this is how the program's gonna work. So this was up, up front, it was all there on the, on the one page, they could all look at it. Yep. So that was um, that was really key, is providing the resources and the guidance. It's not, it's not a free for all. Yep. Um, you know, there was a lot of ideas and we didn't put a limit on the types of ideas at all, but, um, it's very much about giving them some structure. So that mm-hmm. was that was really really important. Um, you know, there's sometimes a notion that innovation is just this great creative thing, and you just sort of sit around and yeah. throw ideas, and you write, and then it just makes so idea happen. But putting some structure around it was was really important. Um, and getting the executive buy-in, like we spoke about mm-hmm. before. Um, you know, like we we launched it, we had the executive buy-in, we had yourself come and do it, do a keynote to build mm-hmm. some um, build some interest across the business. We had our MD. Uh, introduce yourself and yeah, have yeah. Give a bit of a talk at the start so that made it clear that top of the organization was involved um, and then you know partnering with people like yourself to get some a bit of a external um, understanding and, and um, validation of what you're doing and what you're doing is the right thing yeah. especially in the early days when you, you're trying to work through it um, you're not going to have all the answers so find like we're talking about the partnerships find other people that can help you along the way as well 
um, and then sort of keep keep the momentum going. You know, that that was probably a thing for us. You know, that we've had some changes across the organisation in the last sort of six to eight months. Um, just after the innovation fund was, mm-hmm. was sort of was finished, the first round was finished, and so what that meant is that, you know it's a bit of disruption, and so we had, and I myself I went away for, for six weeks on holidays. Yeah. So keeping that going, and so it's sort of so that's that's an interesting point because this is where things often come unstuck mm-hmm. in a lot of organisations. They might, and it's not even just from the context of innovation in large companies, but even in government generally, you might have some sort of big, hairy, audacious program, but then. There's an election and things completely change, or there might be a machinery of government government change and things fall over. So, how have you guys managed to maintain that momentum despite organisational restructures? Yeah, so for us, it was um, we probably lost a little bit for a couple of, mm-hmm. for a month or two there, um, but we sort of we've started to really sort of get it back. So the, the key was to just say, well, we're losing a bit of momentum, um, yeah. just admit it, and then say, all right, well, what do we do about it? You know, and um, so part of that is um, yeah, getting back out there again. So we're going to run out. We're going to run a hack day um, in a month's time. Yep. Um, so that's one thing we're going to get that going. Um, we'll start. We'll create a video um, for their internal. Um, we have the thing called the spill, which goes out to our employees weekly. So like what's going on across City West Water? So put a video on there. Like where are the ideas at? Because some of the ideas had moved along, like the chatbot and the um, VR ideas in particular, had moved along a fair way, even despite within the momentum sign a little bit. Yeah. So so celebrating celebrating that, that, that you know there is stuff is still been going and getting the word back out that you know, it's still really important. We're still pushing on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah we're, the the hack day is hopefully gonna keep pushing through some some more ideas yeah. and sh- just to also as part of a mechanism for exposing other people across the business, you know, getting them involved. You know, there's a few a few lucky ones of us who came here and spent a day learning yeah. about this stuff, but we can broaden that up to, to to more people mm-hmm. um, and expose them and expose them to innovation design thinking just yeah. the idea of moving fast prototyping so those um, those are key things and then we're, all, we're also looking to how can we what are the next steps and so mm-hmm. we've got a, a program for bringing innovation into our capability framework mm-hmm. um, we've got some things around how can we reward and incentivize innovation so that's a, that's a really key key point though yeah so we've got a program that's basically um, staff recognition program mm-hmm. and so there's a number of different areas you can get recognition for so leadership customer service mm-hmm. and innovation is one of them and then we've done a bit of focus on right, well, how do we get people, more people recognized and nominated for that um, as well so we're certainly looking at driving that so it was just I guess it was mainly about okay well things have changed we've hit a bit of um, we've stalled a little bit yeah. but we'll just get back on and keep going mm. um, and that's all you can do so Having that sort of involvement from day one, like we talked about earlier, was probably one of the keys behind maintaining that um, momentum despite the small sort of bump in the road. Yeah. Once that restructure took place. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got you know the uh, it was in strategy. So that's yeah. uh, it all comes back to yeah. that whole thing that we we made a commitment. It was made a key part of that strategy, and we can always we go back to that. And mm-hmm. that's sort of that, that north star, that guiding light that we can yeah. um, keep going back to. And say, you know, even if the momentum has fallen away or things have happened, but it's still there, we still need to deliver on this and let's make it happen. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it looks like, um, you know, given where you guys are in your journey, it's still relatively early, but you have come quite a long way in, in, that, in a short amount of time, I think, in so far as shifting the needle on awareness and engagement is concerned. And also the way people think, you said you're running out of the hack day in a month's time, you're going to open that up to more people. And I know from the first um, hack day that we ran here at Collective Campus, just seeing how people, um, you know, we fostered a lot of aha moments Mm. when it came to how quickly you can actually test an idea and how cheaply you can do that. Like the chatbot idea, for example, I think we used a tool called ChatFuel to just build something and integrate it into the Facebook page. And it literally took like an hour or so to do that and start putting something out there that customers can start engaging with. And the lesson is not so much about, well, this is going to work, and it's about how quickly can we validate whether or not this is even a good idea. And if we can do that in a few hours or a few days or a few weeks even, it's much better than the old model, which is let's just, you know, this seems like a good idea. Other organizations seem to be doing this, so let's just go full steam ahead, invest tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on this, and then fingers crossed, once it goes to market, people will actually engage. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's the thing. The theme for our hack day is is, pro, is getting a prototype. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be an amazing prototype. It doesn't have it's just about testing your idea. So um, for us, that's going to be the theme that we keep working with is mm-hmm. 
move move quickly we, on, in low risk areas we can contain it yeah. um, and try and try things and then at the end of the day have a learning and your learning might be that your prototype didn't work yeah. or the idea is just maybe not feasible or it might be that there's something here um, so for us it's certainly going to be a, a key thing will be um, yeah getting getting that prototype testing it not spending um, not spending too long trying to trying to just work uh, work it through to, in theoretically of death. Yeah. It's about, you know, okay, well, this is, this is got, does this work? I might do, well, let's give it a try. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that'll be that theme for the, for the day. And um, hopefully, yeah, people will not only have, like, have a lot of fun doing it, then we can, at the end, get some learnings. And whether, if they, even if those are learnings or what not to do, then that's still learning. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll certainly be um, pushing that forward um, mm-hmm. and try and take that where we can as um, in nice little areas where it, it suits is to say, okay, well, let's move quickly on this little thing, let's make a good prototype. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's certainly going to be um, a key, uh, hopefully a key learning for us. Yeah, I'm sure it will be, I'm sure it will be. So I uh, wanted to digress or, or just go off on a side mm-hmm. sidestep for a second. Talk about water or innovation in water globally. Mm-hmm. I mean, what kind of things are you seeing and what really excites you in the space? Yeah, well, I think there's, there's a lot of space in terms of intelligent Networks. Yep. So the idea of using sensor technology to um, uh, to, to understand where water is being used at the second it's being used. Mm-hmm. Um, there's and, and also with, with the sewer network, what's happening in the sewers, um, what's in there, yep. um, where what are the sources. So one of the things that happens, you know, all this stuff comes to the treatment plant at the end, and you've got to, you know, sometimes there are there are bad things in there that you, you particularly don't particularly want the yep. contaminants and those sorts of things. Well, you can find that by like, using things like sensor technology. Um, and data analytics, machine learning, those sorts of things, so you can start to understand and source sources even better. Yep. Um, provide better customer service with things like chatbots, and there, there are a few, I think, globally that are starting to look at that as well. Um, but yeah, the, the intelligent networks is something that we're that a lot of corporations are starting to to uh, embrace. Mm-hmm. And how can you how can you get there? How can you create a network where you know what's happening instantaneously, and you can make decisions accordingly um, in terms of getting more out there proactively for maintenance when things break. Um, you know, you can hopefully get to a day where you've got some machine learning to give you some tips around what, what's, you know, this. we think this particular asset is more, more vulnerable than other ones, you know, mm-hmm. that um, can bring that extra layer of machine um, grit mm-hmm. and, um, and processing power to the fore um, to leverage that as well. Um, so there's a, there's a lot in that space. I know in, a, in particular in other countries around water security and water treatment, there's lots of different technologies. I know the X Prize have got a prize for yeah. taking water out of the atmos- uh, atmosphere to be at, and at, with net zero emissions, we're using renewable power. There's like mm-hmm. a great X Prize around that front. So water being such an uh, important resource for people, there's a focus um, globally around it. I mean, Israel is, is a source of lots of water innovation as well. Um, and so they're, they're also one to look to. Um, and just it's just big data. Like everyone says, you know, big data. Yeah. But like there, there's there's lots of information out there. It's not so much getting more information. It's about what can you do with the information that you have. Um, and so for, for us, that'll be another one as well. Is how can we leverage the data we have better mm. before opening ourselves so we want more more data. It's about well, there's, there's a fair bit there. What what are the interesting and intelligent things we can do with that yep. to improve our services just straight off the bat? Yeah. Um, so th- there's a heap of heap going on in that space as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's like, like anything, it's an it's a, uh, environment you know, focused on reliability and security, um, but with the challenges that the world faces around with, with those issues, um, mm-hmm. there's, there's pressures for innovation and that's, so in that space, there's things are starting to pick up, I think, globally. So it's about moving more from a reactive sort of frame of working to a proactive one, mm-hmm. because at the moment, you don't know where the pipes are going to burst, you don't know if something winds up in your, mm-hmm. in your treatment plan that shouldn't be there, like you said, and could be contaminants and all sorts of stuff. So um, effectively helping us be more proactive and that also helps us get more value out of our workforce because we're not wasting money being reactive and obviously if you can pick something up or pick something up much earlier in the piece than later, then naturally it's gonna be much cheaper to, to sort out that problem. Yeah, absolutely. And you got a chance to ena- enable people, empower more people to spend more of their time doing those really, um, Solving those really key problems, yeah. you know, because you've got some of that, some of that machine learning can, that mobilizes, um, that it supports other human decision making. You know, that they can empower the people there, that gives yeah. them access to stuff they didn't have access to before. And imagine what, like, like we don't even know what they can do with that yet because they haven't had it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a heap um, in that space that we can yeah provide better resources to our to our staff to free them up to focus on 
other things that they want. Because lots of staff, when you talk to them, they've got lots of ideas. It's about freeing them up to, to work on the best of those ideas. Mm. Um, and that this is part of how you do it. You put tools in their hands, useful yeah. tools in their hands. Yeah. They can they can do that. Definitely. And I guess in, in globally, in terms of, say, your more developing economies who have a constant, say, water a shortage crisis on their hands. I mean, what are you seeing in that space? Um, yeah, so there's there's a, there's a great uh, charity for water aid, which mm-hmm. we support, and there's a bunch um, of other water corporations that support it here that works on provide, help going out to um, developing countries and taking the knowledge um, that, that exists in developing ones around developing secure resources and yeah. um, water supply and, and, and working with them to develop that. So we had a team that um, raised a bunch of funds and designed a system um, for a, a community in a mm-hmm. developing country. Um, so, like those are the sorts of things that are happening. There is lots of um, entrepreneurs in that space. Yep. Talk about the X Prize that he's starting to get involved um, because yeah, there's so there's so much knowledge and understanding in, in, in our country and in other developed countries around how you manage how you manage water resources mm-hmm. that we can pass on. There's, the, the lessons have been learned in a lot of areas, and that's how you take you can take it to them. Um, yep. But there's also opportunities in that space to to also avoid the things that we that didn't work out so well. You know, but it's great what to do's and what not to do's. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly lots of partnerships and an awareness from us and others that we have not only a duty as a community citizen, but as a global citizen, um, you know, to help and support um, those communities um, mm-hmm. and using different charities and different organizations um, to do that. Fantastic. I think we've come down to the money end of the show. Um, and as a Future Squared listener, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the three questions I ask all my guests at the end of the show, Sean. So I um, hope you've done your, done your homework on these. So question number one, Sean. If you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Okay, well, obviously outside of City West, um, that for me, I think uh, Tesla, when they made the first electric car, yeah. I think that, that the guts on, from, from Elon Musk to, to go out and shoot for that, yeah. I think to be a part of that, that group that, you know, we look at like it obviously wasn't the perfect car in the end, like but look where they are now. Like, but to make that first one, I think, yeah, it, to to be one of the engineers or something on, on that um, project would be uh would be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the risks they took and you know operating in the red for most of the time and all the money he made from PayPal, he's pretty much invested into Tesla and now SpaceX and willing to push the boundaries. I mean, the greatest story, I mean, one of the my favorite stories to tell is the whole SpaceX mm. one where three times they launched, three times they had near their explosions. They had one shot left, they took it, and they managed to get the, the rocket into orbit. And since then, they've managed to successfully launch rockets, land them back on Earth, both on sea and at land. And now they're, they've got countless you know, government contracts to launch satellites into space and talking about colonizing Mars and becoming an interplanetary mm. species and travel, um, Earth travel from, say, New York to China in under an hour using similar technology. Mm. So, But they needed to be willing to take those big, bold, hairy, audacious risks mm. um, to open up these opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that that was an opportunity to solve a global problem in terms of uh, carbon emissions and yep. creating a sustainable resources um, for ways of, of transport. Yep. Yeah, it's such a meaningful goal with with the head that went after with a lot of guts, it's um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, and that's the thing also about uh, Elon Musk, where people they might see him as this crazy visionary entrepreneur, but if you look at everything he does, whether it's Neuralink, or Boring, the Boring Company, um, SpaceX, Tesla, uh, everything comes back to some really core purpose um, that affects every human being on the planet, mm. which you know as a previous Future Squared guest, uh, Brad Stolberg says purpose is the number one performance mm-hmm. enhancer and can't speak enough about how, how important it is to have that at, at our core. So I'll move on to question number two, Sean. Mm-hmm. And question number two, if you could ask anyone a question dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Yeah, this I'm, I'm really glad that I listened to the show before so I <laughs> uh, thought in case this question came up because it's, it's a hard one. Um, I think personally, so... I, like, kind of like yourself, I'm pretty quite interested in the Stoic philosophy stuff. Yeah. So Marcus Aurelius and his book Meditations. Mm-hmm. But I'm all, and I'm really a bit, a bit of a history buff as well, Roman history in particular. Yeah. Um, so, but for me, Marcus being the, the philosopher king, the wise man, all, and all those things, and he passed on the throne to his son Commodus, who's yeah. the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people um, had gone before Marcus had hadn't 
had chosen the next emperor not based on their on a lineage, based on that Marcus wasn't in line for the throne. He was just picked oh. because he was quite possibly a wise wise person. And so, yeah, my question would be asking Marcus as to why his son, what, like, why not pick someone else, and also why his son ended up what the way he did. Like, I'm just fascinated by that that you can have one man so wise, so often selfless in his writings, um, and then have a, have a son that was not so. Um, not so much. So yeah, that a conversation with him would be pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because you see that play out today in today's society as well, where I say the parents may be very well off, educated, great jobs, but oftentimes their kids may see that as an opportunity to just take the easy road, mm. which was the case mm. uh, with Marcus's son. Mm. And I think my, uh, who is it? Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in his book um, Outliers, mm. where he talks about. The perfect sort of upbringing for a child isn't to have all the bells and whistles and the trappings of wealth. It's not to have, you know, the lifestyle of a kid growing up in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. It's somewhere in between mm. where you have the opportunity, but you still have that hunger. Yeah. Um, it's a good balance there. And then perhaps the hunger was, was lacking in that case. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it's really interesting when you, when you look back. I mean, yeah, just such an interesting person when you look, read the book and you read the um, analysis around around Marcus and how things um, ended up played out in the end was yeah. um yeah I just I find that whole thing fascinating yeah fantastic likewise likewise a big fan of Marcus Aurelius Seneca and all the all the Stoics and speaking of Stoics obviously you're you're a fan of philosophy um, which you know I think is one of the best sort of methods to stay grounded and just operate it's it's, it's a system to operate mm-hmm. in today's society I, I feel more than anything else what other rituals or routines do you have to just stay on top of your game um so i'm quite lucky in that we live in an apartment building with the gym mm-hmm. um so it's quite easy for me to ro- ro- roll out of bed in the morning yeah. um and get there so i find that really worthwhile not for long for 20 25 minutes yeah. in the, each morning i find it really helpful for me just getting myself up and going um, and then I suppose the other one is I've probably stolen from Tim Ferriss is a bit of uh, journaling. So I, I I haven't I never did that as a kid. Yeah. Never I was never really interested. And then he, Tim Ferriss talked about it, and I was like, oh, well, if it's good enough for Tim, it's probably uh, good enough for most people. So I just yeah. So each night, sort of writing down the, the sort of three wins and a few other bits and pieces, just a bit of self reflecting each day that yeah. I found has um, been really helpful for me. So yeah, they're probably the two things that that, that I do. Perfect. Try to do every day. Yeah, so exercise, philosophy, and journaling. Mm. Perfect, love it. Okay, so Sean, where can people go to connect with yourself if they want to find out a little bit more about the City West Waters Innovation Program or just find out a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I suppose the best place is LinkedIn for me. Yeah. Um, just Sean Hanran on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably somewhere, on, probably one of the few platforms I'm, I'm active on. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to if anyone to send me a message or connect yeah. through LinkedIn or, or yeah, absolutely, we'll be happy to, to chat to anyone. Perfect, love it. Um, I'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. So thanks again for appearing on Future Squared. I think you've um, left our audience with a lot of lessons, particularly in so far as innovation within the context of a large wholly owned government sort of agency is concerned because it's easy to fall into the trap of making excuses and saying, well, we can't innovate because we've got all these regulations and everything else and we're using taxpayer dollars. But the fact is every organization needs to innovate and to not look at that would be irresponsible and an irresponsible use of taxpayer dollars. So I absolutely love the work you're doing at City West Water. love the work the organization and the um, senior stakeholders and GMs are doing as well and um, wish you all the best with the program. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. Hey guys, it's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collect collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Golovesky. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.